Let's say you want to develop a video game in which the player can roam around 8 kilometers or maybe 15 kilometers or even 41 kilometers. But before we get into that, we should first learn about height maps. To use a height map, you need to slap a 3D grid over it and then for every vertex on the grid, sample its Y coordinate from the height map. If we switch to 3D, we get something resembling terrain. If we want to increase or decrease the resolution of the terrain, we can change the density of the grid. I'll refer to the highest resolution grid as LOD0 and then LOD1 and so on. Now let's say that the player is here. If you want to render the terrain at the highest resolution, LOD0, then the distant terrain, the part that you barely see, will eat up a lot of resources when rendered. If you render everything with the lowest LOD, then the terrain close to the player would look too low resolution. To fix this, we can split our terrain into chunks and then, based on their distance from the player, assign them an LOD and run this algorithm every frame as the player moves. We can tweak the distance parameters of the algorithm to gain more control over the LOD system. Now let's take a look at how the underlying system renders our terrain. The brute force approach is to issue one drockle per instance, leading to 16 drockles in this case, which is not great. Another approach is to use instance rendering. This way, we issue one drockle for each LOD. That's because we need to switch the index or vertex buffer, depending on the implementation. Uh, that's better, but still not good enough. The best method is to take advantage of tessellation hardware. This way, we can render the whole terrain with only one instance draw call and then control the density of the grid in the tessellation evaluation shader. Using this last method, I run a quick benchmark on an integrated GPU with different distance factors. Now that this terrain is 2 square kilometers. This method is a key for small terrains, but let's see how we can improve performance further. All these planes are made out of four chunks, so four instances. What if we take a quad from LOD0 and stretch it twice its size? Doing this, we render a bigger area using just one drop hole. We can do the same for the next LOD using the one lower. Let's see this in action. A terrain that used to take 16 instances now only takes 7. But there's a problem with distance based LOD we might get overlap between different LODs. To fix this, we can use a better structure for the terrain, a quad tree. You start with a quad as big as the whole terrain. Then, recursively, for each quad that the player is inside, we split it into four, and so on, until we reach our desired level of detail. Let's take a look at a bigger example. You can see the instance count going down using this method and also there's no overlap. Ok, but now let's take a look at some maps. From now on out, all pixel counts are squared, so when I say 8 pixels, I mean an 8 by 8 pixel patch. The same goes for meters. Let's say the range chunks are 128 pixel wide. And 2 pixels on the height map represent 1 meter. So, one terrain chunk covers 64 meters. So, for an 8 km world, we'd need a 16K resolution height map. If we use a float 16 format for the texture, that's 16 bits per pixel, the height map would be around 500 megabytes. Doing the same maps for a 16 km world gives us a 2 GB height map. And for 32 km, 8 GB, which is not good at all. Let's see what we can do about this. Let's take a look at 8 meters of terrain, which is 16 pixels of the height map. When rendering on a lower resolution, sampling here makes the GPU choose between 4 nearby pixels. If we use nearest filtering, 3 of those pixels are discarded. So, we can just remove those 3 pixels entirely and store only 8 pixels instead of 16. Same 8 meters, now represented by 8 pixels. Do this again, and we can represent 16 meters using just 2 pixels for our lowest LOD. Now, let's zoom out to 2 kilometers of terrain. We can downscale the image to represent different LODs. This is called the MIF chain of the texture. During runtime, we can't keep the entire height map in memory, let alone all these MIF levels. And when rendering, we usually only need a few chunks, maybe from this MIP or maybe that one. 
So instead of storing the whole thing, we can just keep the chunks that we actually need in memory. One way to do this is called virtual texturing. With virtual texturing, we use a physical texture to hold the actual data, just the parts we need. The full height map is treated as a virtual texture, which is divided into chunks at multiple resolution levels. To map between the virtual texture and the physical one, we use an indirection texture. This tells us, if you're trying to sample from this virtual coordinate, go look at this place in the physical texture. While rendering for each chunk, we look up its physical location using the indirection texture, then sample the height data from there. To make this system work, we need to serialize the entire height map into two files. The first is a binary file that holds the raw chunk data. The second one is a metadata file that stores the offset of each chunk inside the binary file. And we repeat this process for as many MIPS as we need. But let's take a step back. What happens if a chunk is requested before rendering, but hasn't been loaded at the time of rendering? Well, our terrain ends up with a big hole in it, and we don't want that. Let's fix it. Before rendering, the system starts by requesting concentric rings of terrain chunks around the player, starting from the lowest resolution LOD. These requests are sent to the underlying streaming system, but when it's time to render, we may only have a subset of those chunks actually loaded. To ensure we always get a valid visual result, we can use a method introduced by Ubisoft in one of their GDC talks. Here's how it works. We iterate through every chunk in the lowest resolution LOD. If all of the chunk's children are loaded, we push the children into the processing queue. If any are missing, we keep the parent chunk and add it to the render list. We repeat this process for each chunk in the processing queue. By the end, we'll have a list of terrain chunks that we can safely render based on what's currently loaded. Let's take a look at an example in motion. Watch how the physical texture updates dynamically as the player moves. Now for a quick benchmark. For a 2 km terrain, performance is similar to the previous method, but on an 8 km world, the results remain solid even on an integrated GPU. So before each frame is rendered, the system goes through several steps. Request no chunks based on player position. Update the physical texture with newly loaded data. Update the indirection texture. Update the status texture. Generate a quad tree structure. Update the LOD texture for smooth LOD transition. And finally, render the terrain. The big advantage of this system is that it allows us to load an arbitrary number of chunks per frame and still produce a valid terrain render no matter how much data is missing. Let's explore another method. Remember how you were requesting terrain chunks around the player? Instead of using visual texturing, which requires managing chunk location and shuffling data, we can try a simpler approach. What if we store chunks in order using a separate texture for each LOD level? This gives us, for example, three textures, each representing the high map at a different zoom level. This technique is called clip mapping. When rendering with clip maps, each LOD level has a hole in the center, like a donut. That hole is filled in by the next high resolution LOD centered around the player. The only LOD that's rendered fully is the highest resolution one. Let's take a look at an example. You might notice that clip maps chunks aren't always laid out in perfect order. That's because when updating the texture, we use the modulo of the chunk position for X and Y coordinate, allowing us to avoid moving existing data around in memory. This gives the system efficient and avoid unnecessary texture copies. When we run a benchmark, the performance is very similar to the virtual texture method, but we've eliminated a lot of complexity from the management side. To summarize, the steps are request chunks, update the clip map textures, and render. The advantage of clip mapping is that it's easier to implement and often faster. But there's a catch. We can't render partial results like we could with virtual textures. So if a chunk is missing when rendering, we can't just fall back to a coarser LOD. We have to wait until everything is loaded. To deal with this, we loaded the required chunks into an auxiliary buffer over multiple frames. Right before rendering, we copied the data from this buffer into the clip map textures. This means clip mapping needs more memory since we're holding both the live texture and the temporary buffer. There's still room for improvement. Let's take a look at the place where Kerr Moran is building The Witcher 3. You can see that there's a lot of flat terrain made out of many triangles. A side view of a terrain chunk would look like this. When rendered at the different resolutions, we can see the individual segments that make up the terrain. What we can do is break the terrain chunk into multiple regions. Then, for each region, we compare its current LOD with the highest resolution LOD, compute the vertical error, which is the absolute value of the difference between the vertex position in the current LOD and the one in the highest resolution LOD, and store the maximum error in a vector. 
In the end, we can use this vector to select the appropriate level of detail for each region. Now, doing this on a 2D high map. We split the high map into 16 by 16 pixel control points. These are the regions I mentioned earlier. And store the vertical error value in a separate 64 by 64 texture that looks like this. Looking again at the previous example, you can see that flat surfaces are made up of fewer triangles, boosting performance. This technique is described in GPU Pro 3 and in CD Projekt Red's GDC presentation on the Witcher 3's terrain system. If we run a benchmark, you'll see that the rendering time is cut in half. Terrain rendering is complex, and I've only described a small part of it. For an actual video game, you will still need things like lighting, self-shadowing, texturing or virtual texturing, foliage and mesh blending.